I wanted to introduce our next speaker, Patrick. He's a senior research scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Lab, and it is his second time presenting at our workshop. He was very popular the first time around. Patrick, thank you so much for agreeing to participate, and please share your screen. Thank you, Marcin. Uh, hope I don't disappoint you the second time. <laughs> Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, yes, we do. <clears throat> okay, perfect. So, so I'd like to first thank you, Marcin and uh, and Oriba uh, and uh, Andre at Oriba for organizing all this, putting it together. Just to set the grim tone of my of my talk, uh, I will start with a quote by an anonymous scientist that uh, I respect a lot. So he shall not be named because of the nature of the quote, which is, "Plasmons were great up until they were rediscovered by chemists." So before alienating half of the listeners, I just a little spoiler alert, I myself am a chemist. Okay? So, and these works were basically sequentially funded uh, uh, through different uh, projects and programs over the years. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, given the scope of the stuff we do, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, basically uh, activities that are cross-cutting and then uh, that, that uh, basically can be used, uh, these technologies to just look at different things. So this is just a general overview of the things we do beyond PERS and, and my lab. Uh, the first is, uh, uh, let me see if I can get my pointer. Yes, so the first is this thing shown over here. And this is an interferometric uh, time result photo emission electron microscopy. Um, that's interesting, so. Okay, I cannot play the movie, but uh, let me see. All right. Anyways, there is a movie here <laughs> which shows a femtosecond nanometer imaging of propagating plasmons. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna uh, worry about playing that movie because it doesn't pertain to the, to the talk I'm going to be telling you about today. So we also look, do a lot of multimodal spectral imaging, uh, mostly on the micro scale. And by multimodal, I mean things like Raman fluorescence, even optical absorption and extinction, like dark field scattering. This is something on the biology side. This is actually a single cell. Uh, side to side here is about three microns. And we have, in this case, optical absorption images encoded in every pixel. So these are three spectra taken at the regions that are indicated. These are single pixel spectra that you can use to look at chromophores. And in this case, this is a T Lutea cell. So we dabble in IR SNOM, I'm not the expert, but we do so in collaboration with folks that they are. So uh, Brian came from Marcus Reschke's group and he's doing these measurements uh, with us at PNNL as part of a project that's led by Scott Lee and the objective there is actually bioimaging. And of course, Tippin has Traman that we're going to be uh, hearing about a lot today. And all these names that I show here today will, uh, will uh, have pictures with them at the end. So <clears throat> this is just an overview of uh, why I think it's lucrative to be doing Tippin uh, Hestrom in a national lab setting. We have lots of toys. Uh, in context, these are very useful toys. Um, in fact, I'm going to be giving you one example today whereby all these technologies are put in concert to advance our fundamental understanding of uh, uh, basically TERS as well as the optical resonances and structures of uh, tips that look like this. So these are basically, this is a helium ion image of a tip that I use for TERS. Nothing special about it. We prepare them every day. We sputter gold and silver on otherwise commercial silicon cantilevers. And we do so once, twice, three times a day, as much as we need to. So we have ways of looking at their morphologies, even with sub nanometer using electron ion microscopy, their optical spectra. I'll show you an example of that, of a tip array. Uh, so photo emission electron microscopy is useful in context because if you time integrate it, you can actually get an idea of the optical field enhancement, uh, at least at the colors that we use in the nonlinear photo emission electron microscopy. More on this later, very briefly. Of course, AFM Raman, which we do is sequentially or simultaneously. And we have ways of doing nanolithography. This is a directly written nano junction in a, in a polycrystalline uh, silver film uh, imaged with electron microscopy, but the etch we did with, uh, helium, ion, uh, with helium ions. So, of course, not mentioned above is a whole bunch of theory that uh, I'm actually the group theoretician, funny enough. But I do so uh, using NWCAM, PNNL's uh, basically own uh, quantum chemistry uh, software. 
And uh, I have very good friends, Edo Opera and Neil Govin, that are basically uh, developers of this code. I fully take advantage of their uh, expertise uh, to do uh, basically uh, quantum mechanical simulations that are tough and would not be otherwise possible. So I start with a little bit of a philosophical overview of why it is I do what I do from my perspective. So simply, you know, by putting the slide the way I do it, I am equating between ultra-sensitive Raman spectroscopy on the nanoscale and high resolution stirs simply because i mean i have many reasons for this but if you think about it and you have a basically spatial resolution on the order of one or a few nanometers i'm going to show you examples of that then uh, how how many molecules can you, can you pack simply so the, the geometrical argument is one argument but of course we have lots of frequency domain proofs and evidences of single molecule uh, sensitivity so on the left over here, I just, you know, this is gen general single molecule, uh, basically stuff or ultra sensitive uh, equivalently. So you have a broad uh, distribution here. This is a probability. This could be a Raman peak. So we think of, uh, you know, that as arising from inhomogeneous and, uh, and homogeneous broadening, a bunch of molecules contributing to the peak and broadening. it. So single molecules in theory should be these discrete resonances uh, that appear in different colors over here. And if you sum up all the single molecule resonances, uh, you know, and, and you're ergodic essentially, then you can recover the ensemble. But the story is more complex than that. Uh, you know, uh, W.E. Murner at Stanford and others got Nobel prizes for actually highlighting the fact that single molecules very often fall outside uh, the, the conventional normal distribution. So the statement that I'd like to make here is the interaction of a single molecule with its immediate local environment can be perturbing. Uh, such that uh, the resonance is actually uh, new, okay? And someone asked that anonymously. Uh, so if you, now, now this is a frequency domain, uh, basically spectrum. You can go to the time domain, that's simple inverse FFT, and you can FFT back and recover a frequency domain response. So this back and forth uh, applies. Uh, time is uh, basically this time invariance. But it's very interesting to think about a single molecule response uh, in the time versus frequency domain. So this, this, this relationship, does it hold? This is just a fundamental philosophical question. Uh, I do not have, have the answer to it, except in theory. And the answer is no. Yeah. So more generally, if you, if you think about uh, you know, the Schrodinger equation, we've all seen it at some point, hopefully. So it's left hand is this h nu. And over here, you have the minus h bar deep psi by dt. So, you look at it and you realize that most spectroscopy historically has been done um, by changing the parameters of this H, uh, which is the guy that generates the measurement signal. So this is Stephen Hans um, in the in the imaging and detection side of it. So you can detect a single molecule. This is that many moles. Uh, it's called the octomole. And then uh, for an analytical chemist, this is a 10 picoliter volume of a, a 10 to minus 10 molar solution. So the right-hand side uh, is, is often less exploited in spectroscopy, I would say. Uh, but it is in this, the way I write it, is trying to understand the time evolving state, which gets back to this picture of, uh, of basically uh, a resonance that's falling outside of the nominal resonances of uh, what you'd expect to see from a certain system. So more generally than, you know, really thinking about the time evolving state and, you know, it is really uh, trying to understand the interplay between a molecule and its local environment by looking at the terse spectra in this case. So we're going to try and invert the terse spectra or try to ask the question, what does the molecule tell me about its very interesting local environment, which in our case is plasmons, different kinds of plasmons, right? So this is the general scheme. We have a plasmonic tip, a sample. I'll get, uh, you know, I'll get to that. And this I'm going to explain in more detail here. So these are just general remarks on historical, you know, ensemble average drama and scattering. You have a photon that goes in, excites randomly oriented molecules, and a photon that comes out. The difference between these two photons, if you, if you draw it in a diagrammatic fashion like this, so a photon in, photon out, uh, the difference between it is just the vibrational state of a molecule. Okay, I'm going to be telling you about molecules, not PMDs. So it's very useful, actually, to, to, to think about this in a little bit more detail. So this state over here can be real or virtual. This is normal versus resonant. Raman, resonance Raman. Uh, it's also useful to unsquare these photons and recognize that there are four fields involved in Raman spectroscopy, although we only provide two of these fields, the photon that you put in. So this is how you immediately recognize how a spontaneous 
Raman scattering process can tell you about things like dephasing of molecular vibrations that happens over picoseconds later, tens of picoseconds sometimes. And this is how you rationalize this very famous E over E zero to the fourth power, uh, basically uh, uh, law. Uh, so first signal follows that law. And that is because you have actually four electric fields. So fields and the complex conjugates are all enhanced. So if you look at the spectrum, this is benzene. This is a relatively high resolution uh, spectrum of benzene. You have peaks, we know how to name them. So these are different resonances of benzene in this case. Um, there are three and minus six resonances in any realistic molecule that we care about at least. So on the y-axis over here, you have the classical Raman selection rules. I call them classical because this is, if you vibrate along any of these basically coordinates, if you change the polarizability of the molecule, the more you change it, the, the more Raman active it's gonna be, very simply. Something that we invoke without thinking about because the textbook says so, is this. So the wavelength of light that you put in to get Raman scattering is much larger than the molecular size. This is called the dipole approximation. So I'm going to show you how that breaks uh, and, it, and it does so miserably simply because, you know, if you think about it, so molecular size is not the, the, the thing here. If you think of an excited, you know, electronic state transition, then the extent of that electron box, its size in real space is much smaller than uh, essentially lambda. So multipolar expansions is something we'll get into in this talk. And then, of course, historically, you have these randomly oriented molecules in few molecule Raman, ultra sensitive or high resolution, high spatial resolution Raman. This is no longer the case. So you have to think about the interaction between the fields and then uh, the molecular orientation. I'm gonna give you an example of that. And then the width uh, tells you about vibration dephasing, which is something we're still thinking about. So it's not obvious exactly what governs dephasing in SERS and TERS, SERS and HAT, and TIP enhanced Raman spectroscopy. So if there is one thing we know about the uh, Raman uh, scattering, okay, it's very rich. It has lots of uh, information in it, spectrum and an image. It's very weak though, one in a million photons classically, basically uh, uh, undergo inelastic uh, scattering, Raman scattering. So what we do is we couple molecules with desmonic antenna. So in this case, this is taken from a nice review by uh, late uh, Rick Van Dyne. So you have an electric field that's oscillating. And in this case, this is an actually, I make a deal out of this. You'll recognize why later. This is an actual sphere. Okay? People call spheres things that are not spherical. It's very hard to get your hands on true spheres. Okay? But anywho, so you have light that is oscillating and it could be resonant with the a, with a, with a co you know, collective uh, oscillations of, uh, of uh, surface electrons in this case of some uh, nanoparticle that has a, a diameter that's much smaller than the wavelength of light. I put this over here just to remind you and myself that uh, you know we often think about electric fields uh, being enhanced. It's also useful to remember that you have magnetic fields. And again, this is something that I'll get back to later. So now you take two of these to get, you put them together, all of a sudden you get uh, basically hybrid mode. If you look at this resonance, this is a dipolar resonance, dipolar resonance. If you put two dipoles together, you shake them the right direction, in this case along the long axis of this uh, dumbbell. Then you get an extreme localization and hence an enhancement of the incident and scattered fields. Again, I told you there are four. Uh, so the enhancement follows E over E zero to the fourth power in theory, uh, although we do see deviations from that. So you take this construct, you flip it over and all of a sudden you have a tip on top of the surface. This is the tip enhanced Raman geometry. So I'm, I am making a few approximations by just taking two spheres and flipping them over, but nonetheless, the, the, the principle is the same. You have light, in this case, that would be polarized along the long axis of the tip. And in doing so, you get a hybrid uh, response. This is a plasmonic tip sample nano junction, whereby the field is extremely localized and again, enhanced. Okay. So this is something that, that got really popular, uh, you know, in 2011-ish through 2014, there are a number of science and nature papers about the transition from these classical plasmons that we can simulate over here to so-called quantum plasmons. So quantum plasmons, classical plasmons are essentially localized. If you take two spheres in this case, this is a paper I like a lot, and you bring them closer and closer together, this bonding dipole plasmon that is hot all of a sudden at a small separation distance between these two spheres collapses and gives rise to new uh, eigenmodes. These are the so-called charge transfer plasmons shown over here, for example. So you go from local to non-local. In fact, the field 
decreases as the, as the intraparticle distance uh, basically reaches some kind of threshold uh, separation distance. So that number is about a nanometer. Okay? Uh, and I'll tell you at the last slide why this is kind of important, um, especially when you're doing gap motors in contact mode. So anyhow, so there are lots of uh, hints and indices. This is a theory paper. This is a paper that show, show, showed up later on. And, and this says that if I actually change the molecular layers that basically separate uh, these two objects, in this case, these were two silver nanocubes, actually. So what you see is actually that the molecules themselves can induce new resonances. So the molecule can mediate a transition from a classical plasmon to a shorted junction, of, you know, a non-local plasmon, a quantum plasmon. Call it what you may. In this case, this is two tips, two AFM tips. Uh, it's a nice paper because they could kind of controllably decrease the distance between these uh, two uh, basically metallic tips, essentially, that have balls at the end of them shown over here. These are dark field scattering spectra that show that, okay, at some point, uh, you know, control becomes difficult, particularly on the ambient because you have the snap to contact. But they, they could see a very uh, interesting transition between this, these bonding dipole type modes uh, or dipolar modes in this case. And in the, in the one nanometer type separation, you start to see these non-classical modes. Again, these are these quantum plasmons. So, you know, with, with all this in mind, a little bit of Rama, a little bit of plasmonic enhancement, these are the things that, uh, that I'm going to be telling you about today. So all of a sudden, I go from having many molecules that are uh, not oriented to a single molecule. So now, uh, a single molecule or a few molecules have, you know, very, uh, well-defined orientations. Uh, they can move around in time, of course, on the amine conditions, but you have one molecule. It has its polarizability derivatives, its, its orientation more generally. And then you have the incident and scattered field, which in turns are along the z-axis. So they will be orthogonal to the sample surface, right? All of a sudden, when you have one molecule, you draw out this diagram and you ask the question, is this real or virtual? So when you put a molecule on a metal, <laughs> Uh, doing single molecule uh, uh, optical absorption measurements, like single molecule UVs, if you want, is not exactly trivial. This paper over here uh, from the New Zealand group uh, actually tells you uh, a little bit about that and what that entails. So, you know, and all of a sudden, dephasing is no longer well defined. Uh, e over E0 to the fourth power, you know, generally holds, but what if the excitation, uh, basically, polarization is not along the long axis of the tip, but rather orthogonal? So today I'm going to show you examples of exactly this, the removal of ensemble averaging in terms. I'm going to call that tensorial Raman for reasons that will become evident later. This is in real space. The time analog of it is something I like to call non-ergodic Raman. We've done this in theory. Uh, not going to be going through too many details of that today, unfortunately. The other thing is you start to have fields that vary over the length scale of the molecule. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So this is multipolar Raman, the collapse of the dipole approximation. And you start to see things that are essentially mixed electric dipole and quadrupole and electric dipole magnetic dipole transitions, all right? And then when you put two metals together, you shine light. Your light is AC. Uh, basically, the plasma itself is AC, but you can rectify it. So we do see DC currents indirectly observed through vibrational stark shifts in molecules, much like this one. This is an aromatic uh, thiol that has a cyanoreporter group. And then, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, we'd like to do chemistry or chemists. So um, I will show you examples where it's very clear that you see charged species, radicals, okay? Uh, and you also see things that are basically, you know, chemical changes. Uh, there are classical examples there that we will uh, show you and we will revisit today. And then, you know, uh, you know, by definition, if you think about it, you have a very thin molecular layer. Your tip is in contact with the with a molecule that is otherwise on something like a nanoparticle, uh, all of a sudden you, you realize, you realize that uh, just by definition, uh, alters in contact mode is if the gap is small enough, if you have metal below you, is actually quantum plasmon enhanced drama, okay? Not so much classical. And I think this is why you see all these effects and I'll attest to that to the end. So in terms of setups, we have two setups, one uh, younger than the other. Uh, we like the, the trios that Andre told you about this in, in more detail than I will, but we like the trios because of its flexibility. And we do a lot with it, uh, not just Raman or Tip Enhanced Raman or AFM. We're actually starting to do things uh, like a site top collection to do things like dark field scattering and its variants uh, in the same spot and the same sample that we're going to use for uh, Tip Enhanced Raman. I'll give you an example there. 
So everything is motorized, your piezo objective scanners, your head, although of course, um, your sample, of course, this is a sample scanning AFM, uh, multiple light sources on demand, simply because we do, do not rely actually on Horeba to, 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 uh, to do our optics. Uh, we do not like closed boxes because we would like the flexibility to be able to put in different, uh, basically, lasers. In our case right now, it's a multiple CWs and you know, picosecond white light laser. Uh, we excite collect with, with, with any combination. Okay, so um, we can do site top, ex, ex, site excite top collect, uh, top excite top collect, site side, bottom top, etc. So we, we can do it all, and there are distinct advantages to doing that. Uh, one of the advantages is okay, I can do dark field scattering with CW from the side here and then from top collection. The other thing is if you want to set up these uh, fancy new terahertz Raman filters, it becomes a lot easier if uh, you're almost background free by virtue of the geometry. And also, you know, <laughs> maybe it's me, but uh, aligning the, the, di the dichroic version of those filters became difficult. I'm not going to tell you a lot about the sound today, no terahertz. But anyway, so Andre mentioned this. Uh, this is important, I think, intermittent contact, the so-called spec top mode. So that is uh, uh, moving, when you're moving the sample, pixel to pixel, you're tapping. When you're collecting the spectrum, you're actually in contact, and you define the NF, basically the force exerted by the tip on the, on the sample. We have reported two papers back to back, and these are basically there's a solution. I venture to say these are not one-offs. These are usable, reproducible, transferable, and uh, you will see that, um, that the conditions are rather mild in terms of integration time, and you know, of course, the power and so on. So it's possible we do it only in the bottom excite, bottom collect geometry with the trios, though. No success here as of yet. So. We start with the images. So, so we're going to, I'm going to be telling you a lot about there's images of chemically functionalized, uh, uh, basically nanoparticles. Uh, this is an AU triangle. This is an AU microplate, silver wires, uh, gold nanotubes, uh, gold nanospheres. These are faceted nanospheres. So, you know, we, 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 we spent quite some time trying to really understand the images and the consensus is images, there's images, trace the, 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 the local optical fields in the, in the, in the, in the terse geometry. Okay? There's images of chemically functionalized nanoparticles, no matter what they are, only map the structures of the local optical fields. So you see the edges here, the edges here, a double bump over here. If you go through these papers, you will see that we've done the simulations. We've done these measurements carefully. Uh, they're very reproducible. So, of course, once you see things lighting up at edges, you start to think about edge artifacts. Uh, we know what artifacts look like. Uh, these are not artifacts, okay? And we're writing the paper that, uh, that uh, is going to be painful but important in context, which is really describing all the artifacts that one sees during these measurements. So I'm going to select two examples to just prove to yourself, uh, to, to myself and to you, that uh, this terse mapping of plasmonic nanoparticles uh, actually traces the structures of local optical fields. So these are three different particles. This is a perfect spherical sphere, okay? a smooth spherical nanoparticle. So very hard to come by. Matt Jones at Rice actually provided us with these fantastic spheres. Uh, we can get first signals with about 50 milliseconds, I think, uh, integration with these spheres. They're really clean, really nice, single crystals, actually. So this is what basically is a plasmonic nanoparticle that you, you typically buy from Sigma Aldrich or something like that. And this is a, basically a uh, silver nanocube. You can, again, buy this. Um, Matt did give us some gold nanocubes that I'll tell you about later on. Anyways, if you look at the uh, TEM images of these single particles and you look at TERS, uh, you immediately see something you know, entirely different. So in this case, you just simply trace the edges uh, of, of, of this cube. Uh, it turns out this is how the field looks like in the TERS geometry at our excitation color. Uh, over here, if you look hard enough, you can almost see the facets. Okay, so it looks like the there's images of faceted particles only reveals the facet boundaries where the fields are hottest. Uh, I'm going to tell you that these are actually spatially resolved resonances through the next example that light up again using the same tip. Of course, this is the same measurement uh, at a given particular excitation wavelength, which in this case is 633 in all these cases. So in this case, you see this nice horseshoe shaped profile, which we zoom into in this slide. So this is a TM, this is TERS. And this is nothing but a finite different, difference time domain simulation of uh, what the field looks like if you excite the, 
this part is this, uh, spherical uh, nanoparticle, you know, coming from this side at an angle, which is about uh, 65 degrees uh, uh, with respect to the surface normal. So this is almost grazing angle of incidence. So this is actually this, this, uh, what, you've, what probably you're used to seeing from these, um, uh, uh, what, you, what, what should I call it, like these dark field scattering measurements of, in this case, a particle on silicon. You see these very nice donut profiles. So this is nothing but the donut that is modified by our excitation geometry, okay? So the correspondence between this and the field profile is kind of telling. These are interesting spectra. I'm not going to go through this right now, but, but uh, you know, um, I'll, I'll tell you more about that in the context of, uh, of uh, uh, spotter tips in a few slides. So if you don't believe that this is actually, you know, the field itself, you go forward, and this is, I think, the killer proof that uh, spatially resolved there's, there's maps of chemically functionalized particles actually reveal local optical fields, okay? And even in this case, there are resonances. So this is an AFM of a, of a, of a um, um, in this case, gold uh, nanowire uh, or nanorod. It's limited in length. So if you look at the spectra and this point, this point, and this point, you see this. So we have very high contrast between on-rod and off-rod. This is this uh, off-rod is the green guy. And on the rod, if you look at the different regions of space, the spectra vary in terms of relative intensity. So of course, now we can draw the maps at these specific resonances. And what you see is one, two, three, four, five bumps over here. One, two, three, four bumps over here. This is nothing but mapping the, 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 the nano rod, basically there's image uh, at different resonances of our reporter. So, so far I haven't told you what the reporter is because it doesn't matter. We're just looking at the spatial variations in terms of intensities, okay? So now we, we just basically take a cut over here, take a cut over here. You can see basically these nice wiggles, which are nothing but the multipolar resonances of this rod. So this is very cool, I think. So you're exciting at 633. The Stokes window actually contains in it different resonances, which are actually the multipoles of these uh, particles. And you can go and read that in the, in, the, in, the, in the actual paper. What we can do is we can map the transitions between modes of different order for different rod lengths. So this is a uh, optical eels in a, in, a, in, a, you know, in a nutshell. So this is what people get famous uh, doing eels for with, uh, we can actually do it all with TERS, right? optically. So now having, you know, hopefully convinced you that TERS uh, images of plasmonic particles map the spatial variations in local fields. Uh, uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on the spectra. So this is the life on the left, on the left hand side, depending how you write it. So on the eye, Minus I H bar uh, psi, a deep psi dt, essentially. So the first thing, I, you know, this is the uh, reporter that I'm going to use exclusively unless otherwise uh, stated. This is a uh, aromatic thiol that has this nitrile uh, basically moiety attached to it. This is actually just a one nanometer silver ball uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a molecule chemisorbed onto it. This is optimized, uh, you know, uh, this is just a static DFT optimization exercise. This is actually ab initio molecular dynamics of this rather large uh, system. And you can see that there are multiple possible orientations at 300 Kelvin, right? So you can rely on DFT and uh, the structures you get, uh, doesn't matter what levels of theory you use, uh, uh, we have dispersion correction and so on, story for a different day. You can also try to just take the molecule itself, simulate its spectra, or you can uh, actually, in this case, we, this, this is a nice paper where we inverted the SIRS spectra to be able to, to, to just do a little bit of math, tensor algebra, and then try to get a simulated spectra from ab initio molecular dynamics that takes SERS and TERS uh, selection rules into account. And we can look at the spectrum and tell you the orientation of the molecule on a matter, right? So much like SFG, a higher order process that gives you the absolute orientation, SERS and TERS can give you the absolute 3D orientation of a molecule on a matter. Right? So this is a, a demonstration of it in 2D. Okay, so in this case, this is a gold 111. These are uh, terraces. So inter-terrace steps uh, are on the order of two nanometers. So this is very low aspect ratio, uh, basically change in height from here to here. So this is the third image of our molecule at 15, 80 nanometers. Uh, you see the cross-sectional profile over here. This could be a topographic artifact, but nonetheless, you see a dip, a rise, and then a decay. This is one image, one frequency. So I repeat the measurement. This is another edge over here. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to look at the same response again. At 1580, one of the resonances, I see a dip in the response. 
uh, pure dip. Uh, at 2224, these are simultaneously recorded images, I actually see a rise in the response and then a decay. So I do the measurement once, I get this profile. I do the measurement the next time, I get this profile versus this profile. I repeat the measurement n times, and every time I do this measurement, I get a different answer. Okay? So we went ahead and did this. We took an equation that looks like this. This is in real space. You have an incident field, a scattered field, a molecule, this is more, more, more specifically, it's corrosibility derivative tensors. You have three n minus six alphas. This is the orientation of a molecule in 3D. Field coming in, field coming out. We actually rotate the molecule and try to not try. We, we match spectra at every pixel. So what we're doing is we're doing full Thurs image reconstruction using an equation that looks like this. And after I do the reconstruction, which is based on matching spectra at every pixel, I can take cuts uh, and look at the different variations. So red here is simulated and, and black is theory. And this is for many different cuts. Uh, and you can see, you know, you know the, the, the agreement if co is qualitatively, if, if not quantitatively correct. So we can actually understand this, 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 uh, this, these uh, images that are drastically different uh, just by invoking a little bit of tensor algebra that does nothing but admit the tensorial nature of Raman scattering. So another example of life on the hand side is actually a dual example. I'm going to look at the same molecule again. These are initial molecular dynamics of the molecule itself and it's anion. So in this case, I just drop a hydrogen and I charge it, okay? So this is the charged anionic species, it has a basically, for example, a, a nitrile resonance that is dramatically shifted from the nominal resonance of the neutral guy, which is 2225-ish in experiment. But also this nitrile moiety, you know, it's very well known that if you look at uh, basically things like nitriles, and if you have a DC field, this is the vibration start basically equation, what's gonna end up happening as you will see basically uh, as a function of field, uh, uh, you know, increasing the field strength, uh, there is a linear relationship between the frequency that you observe and the field itself. So that is to say that you can use the measured frequency of the nitrile to estimate or back out uh, uh, the magnitude of a rectified local optical field. And we're going to do this in, in, a, in a mapping uh, direction. So what do you need to do that? You have the nominal frequency, this is 2225. This is the slope of this, uh, of this curve actually do these simulations uh, because there is no known slope in literature of the anion. And this is that, it looks like they are comparable. The anion values for the neutral is 0.6 to 0.7. This is inverse centimeters per megavolt per centimeter. That's a standard unit that they use. Regardless, I can see a resonance in, 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 in real space and I can correlate that with basically the uh, rectified local optical field, right? So I'm gonna use this example um, to show you this, of, although we've seen optical rectification on things varying from, you know, plasmonic uh, nanospheres, smooth uh, plasmonic nanoparticles, uh, plates, pretty much everything we look at, we always see rectified local optical fields, okay? And I'll give you a sense of the strength of that field in a minute. This is AFM and this is SEM of uh, arrays of tips. So this is a tip checker actually sample, a 3D uh, tip uh, characterization sample. So um, you can see these are predefined tips that are separated in space. We just take the, the silicon uh, uh, tip array. We sputter it, in this case, with gold. You do single tip AFM, you can see it's corrugated, of course, we're sputtering on it. And then this is a zoomed in AFM, it's a little bit uh, uh, out of focus, uh, uh, but anyhow, you can see the tip and you can see some corrugation around it. It's probably more clear in the AFM phase image. So, okay, we can characterize its uh, structure. This is beam. So what we're going to do is we're going to shoot three femtosecond, uh, basically laser pulses onto these uh, arrays. These are three different images. You can see individual tip, basically images over here, but uh, these images are essentially photo emission from these tips after exciting them with the uh, three photons. So what does that give me? So if I look at the corrugated surface in the middle between these tips versus the response on top. I can estimate my enhancement or more, you know, I'm not looking for absolute enhancement, but rather relative enhancement. So how does enhancement at this tip differ from enhancement at this tip, right? It's E over zero to the sixth power because we have three photon and hence six fields. And we measured, I think, hundreds of, uh, of, of tips. This is a, basically, you can, you can do so with single tip sensitivity with a ra rather large, basically, field of view. This is 2.5 microns, roughly, the separation between two, two tips. And what you see is e over e0 to the sixth power changes by about 60. So you can do the math uh, to backtrack e over e0 to the fourth power. This says that generally, 
although they're extremely corrugated, as I showed you in the last slide, they're rather uniform in terms of electric field enhancement. That was surprise number one. Okay, so the tips are very rough, but uh, the, even the sixth power of the field does not vary that much going from tip to tip. And this is again done with enough statistics, hundreds of tips. The more surprising story is if you zoom in and you do, in this case, set up, this is hyperspectral dark field scattering, polarization resolved. We're going to look at the, you know, side to side uh, resonances of the tips versus the, the, the resonance we care about, uh, which is the depolarized uh, resonance, the resonance that you can excite with depolarization. What you see is this, some of these tips in this image, uh, the resonances are pretty much on top of each other. Again, very rough tips have rather uniform field enhancements. They have rather uniform, uh, basically, resonances. Of course, the magnitude of the resonances change, but they are, again, in the same place. This is really interesting, because if you go in and look at the terse spectra, this is not noise. This is actually very you know, well-defined uh, resonances. In this case, basically, these are different uh, 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 pixels. The, the response is extremely pixelated. And again, this is not noise. So the response is very highly spatially localized when you look at this. So the picture painted by the uh, even near field photomission electron microscopy field enhancement type, uh, basically, mm -hmm. measurements. And then the far field optical scattering measurements are very different than, than, than the resonances, it seems, that one samples in terse, right? So if I take the spectra that are contained over in, in this little circle over here and I plot them in a waterfall plot um, in this nitrile stretching region, I see two bumps, okay? So I simulated these before. I didn't reproduce it here for some reason. But anywho, so this is the, on average, if I average all the spectra in this uh, circle, I see the neutral resonance and then the anion resonance. Then from there on, you see that there is a spread. So it turns out the spread in this uh, basically uh, frequency over here is nothing but stark shifted resonances. And they move in both directions, the positive and the negative, which is really interesting. So that means that the field is switching directions, uh, which is certainly possible in this kind of configuration. So 46, 5, uh, sorry, 46, 46 are basically the magnitudes in megavolts per centimeter of the local uh, rectified optical field. So this is kind of an interesting distinction over here. Uh, important point to make is if I see a resonance that is shifted basically from this line, the neutral, uh, so this, this is most probably basically the stark shifted neutral molecule. When you see something that's all the way down here at about 2100, you either invoke a field that is much larger than the ionization threshold of the molecule, or you recognize this is actually an anion that is stark shifted from there on. So the molecule itself turns out to be a dual Stark probe. Both the neutral state and its anionic state actually uh, give you different, uh, uh, basically, uh, measures of the local optical field. And again, the upper limit that we measure in this and any structure really is about 48 megavolts per centimeter. So in the third example, I'd like to tell you another little snippet about life on the left-hand side. So in this case, uh, a little bit of a prelude, basically. So these are, again, the simultaneously recorded AFM and there's maps of a, of a functionalized, uh, in this case, silver nanocube. If I take this little region over here and I zoom in, what I see is this is basically the left edge and then the right edge. If I take a cross-section over this right edge, what you see, these are half, half a nanometer step. Okay? I can resolve the rise from uh, no signal on the outside to signal at the edge with one to three pixels or so. Okay. So two nanometers is basically here to here, depending on how you want to do it, 90, 10. Anyways, two pixels visibly, these are half a nanometer steps. Okay. So why is this important? This says that the field is varying over, you know, one or, you know, two nanometers. Okay. This is a far cry from what one invokes to try and understand basically uh, um, ensemble average Raman scattering. So this is to say the, the dipole approximation cannot hold if the fields are varying so sharply in space. So this is life on the left-hand side. So over here, I'm going to basically, this is the one basically alpha for molecular polarizability. These are the generalized molecular polarizabilities. So when you do a field expansion or, mo or a molecular polarizability expansion, you usually truncate at the dipole limit or the basically long field limit or the linear field limit. So now we're going to basically write out the alpha, which is the mu mu. These are two transition dipoles, that's polarizability. That's the one we used to looking at. So that's, you know, only needs a field 
uh, which, is, which is what we can provide even in microscopic and microscopic samples. So once the field basically curves in space or time, okay, so in space, it's going to, to, to be a field gradient in space. In this case, it's a field gradient in time, which is a magnetic field. Then you start to tickle higher order, higher order uh, molecular properties. In this case, this G prime is a mixed electric dipole, magnetic dipole transition. And this A is actually electric dipole, electric quadrupole transition. Okay? Now we can simulate these with pretty high accuracy, actually. So this is DFT simulations of the Raman spectrum. Uh, this is the G, G, G squared, the mixed dipole, elect, uh, sorry, this is the mixed electric dipole, magnetic dipole squared. That's how the spectrum looks like. And this is the A squared, which is the electric dipole, electric quadrupole spectrum. So these are the three spectra one expects to see if you're field dominated or field gradient dominated. All right. So I highlight this area over here because it's an area where whenever I see transitions in experiment, those cannot arise from normal selection rules, dipolar selection rules. Yeah. So G is actually pretty distinct. It shows a very sharp single line that's supposed to look there. And then A shows three lines that uh, can appear in tandem or not, again, because of uh, blinking and tensorial Raman scattering with, with uh, you know, a couple of nanometer type spatial resolution. So here's the result. Here's the third image of, in this case, this is a very, you know, this is a, um, a plasmonic gold uh, nanoparticle, again, coated with my favorite thiobenzonitra reporter. You take a little cross section over here, you can go over it, you see a little bit of a convolution on the outer side. But if you go from on top of the particle to the edge, you can resolve it with, these are single nanometer pixels. So something on the order of three nanometer is my spatial resolution in this measurement. Now, if I take all the spectra that are contained in this image and I average them, and I'm gonna compare them to a very good theory, this is a initial molecular dynamics based, based Raman spectra simulations invoked here again. So what I see is, uh, one, two, three, four peaks uh, that are characteristic Raman uh, peaks of my molecule. And in the middle, I see something that's really weak, okay? So on average, if you average all the pixels, the response in this gray area that I preserved from the last slide is really weak. Of course, I can also use the shifts in, 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 in the nitrile frequencies to again back out the local, localized uh, stark shifted uh, basically resonances and, and, and back out the local direct the magnitude of the localized optical field. Okay. So these instead are single pixel spectra. Okay, so I selected a few single pixel spectra from my image. So these are different positions. And I can see clearly that I have lots of transitions in this area, in this region. Select two over here. One is this uh, orange spectrum, one of these. And then the other is a green spectrum, is this guy. And what I can see very immediately is that this orange spectrum has components from the dipolar Raman scattering from the molecule, but also contains this guy. And this guy is nothing but the enhanced electric dipole, magnetic dipolar spectrum. The next guy, the green, has actually three resonances. This one is not exactly on top of that one, but these two, they show up together, okay, all three resonances. And we can assign that very clearly to the electric dipole, electric quadrupolar spectrum. So we call this tip enhanced multipolar Raman scattering. And we feel this is something that is very important to take into account when you're trying to assign peaks that do not belong to the subset of, uh, of, uh, of um, you know, well-known molecular transitions that are Raman allowed. So if you're trying to do chemistry and probe it with Raman, or more specifically SIRS and TERS, these are things that you should be thinking about, both the charged molecules as well as the multipolar uh, transitions. So this is to that effect. So why worry about all these things that I told you about, optical rectification, and solar uh, Raman scattering, and, and you know, things like uh, uh, multipolar transitions. So you worry about that if you're trying to do chemical reaction imaging. So this is an example from last year, so I'm not gonna go through it uh, in much detail because Marcin and friends saw this already. But a long story short, this, this is again a, uh, you know, a, a nanoplatelet. Uh, these measurements are actually done in solution. So uh, what you have is a, a, you know, a chemically functionalized uh, object. In this case, the, the molecule is nitrothiophenol. Okay? So it's very well known in literature. If you put this on a metal, you shine light on it, you get uh, basically uh, plasmon enhanced dimerization uh, or induced dimerization. Uh, some call it hot electrons, some call it direct electrons. We do not know. We just see the consequence of it. So these two spectra can be assigned to the parent and then to the product. Okay? 
And of course, if you're doing chemistry, the two things you want to worry about is the parent and the product. And indeed, lots of papers, hundreds, no, no, not hundreds, but tens of papers have been dedicated to studying this with SIRS as well as TIRS. So we can have an AFM, we can map where the reactants are, the parent, and then we can see where the products are formed. And you know, you don't see product everywhere where the, where uh, the parent is, <laughs> and that is interesting. We call this that. We, we said that, uh, uh, you know, it, you know, the the product formation map doesn't necessarily correlate with the local optical field, and we got a little bit into trouble. So I wasn't saying that, uh, you, you know, uh, you don't need optical fields to form the product. I'm saying you need optical fields, but there is more to it. So I call it the pre arrhenius uh, basically uh, factor. And then there was a very pretty paper that showed up right around the same time, also in GPC led by Ben Ren, that, that showed that you actually need the right orientation of these uh, molecules uh, and the next guy to be able to form the product. So molecular orientation is an important uh, parameter that hasn't been considered up to you know a, a year ago. So we're going to revisit this reaction. In this case, we're going to look at the faceted uh, silver nanoparticle. And that silver nanoparticle is coated with NTP. This is its stirs map. Again, you see regions uh, of uh, null enhancement. And then, you know, what appears to be like facet boundaries that light up like a Christmas tree. So if you, again, take a cut over here, a cut over here. In this case, this is pixel limited spatial resolution. And the pixel size is three nanometers. So you take all the spectra contained in this, uh, in this uh, image, you average them out, and you get this black spectrum. Okay, these are color-coded labeling of the peaks for reasons that will become obvious later. Okay? Essentially, these three peaks, the, the 1079, 1334, 1571, are nothing but the Raman, uh, basically, um, signatures of nitrothiophenol. 1435, 1389, and 1141 are the product peaks, which we have seen before and others have seen before. These three peaks that I'm going to highlight in green, I was able to highlight them because I did this analysis. This is a 2D correlation analysis of, again, all the spectra contained in region one. So it's a useful way of, of uh, plotting out their spectra, particularly if trying to figure out how many components or how many different species contribute to that spectral image. Okay? This is the math, it's very simple. It's a covariance and, a, and, and statistical variances of the different frequencies. You get a frequency frequency plot. And you can take cuts from that plot to be able to dissect the correlations between the different peaks that contribute to you know, the spectra and the study plot. So what are the different peaks? Uh, of course, we know that the three peaks that I highlight over here using these dashed lines arise from the parent. We know that these peaks arise from the product. And then we get a full spectrum of correlated peaks, you know, 858, 1058, 1289 and you know uh, uh, basically and, and other peaks that, that actually arise from the parent. I'll make a deal out of that in a second. But anyways, there are three species. Okay. So the same chemical basically transformation that we and others studied for years doesn't only have the parent and the product, it has a third species, which you can actually tease out in this case through 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 uh, terms. And, and if you look, clo look closely at other folks' works, these peaks actually appear. Uh, these little, little shoulders here and here, they appear in everybody's spectra, but nobody really analyzed them. So this is nothing but the anion. This is a thiolate that turns out to be stable under, under the conditions. If you're a chemist, you can rationalize how having an S minus and having multiple resonance structures, a thion or a thiolate, can actually stabilize this even under you know, operative conditions in terms. Okay? So here are the parent spectra experiment theory. Here are the product spectra. And the products are the dimer to azobenzene product as well as the thiolate. Okay? You can see this uh, experiment here, theory over here, experiment here, theory over here, and we can account for the majority of the observed peaks. Okay? We can do this all experimentally as well. So what you can do is you recognize that uh, you have peaks over here from the uh, product as well as the parent. So the parent contributes to the to the to the product signatures. That is to say, in the same pixels, you could have both parent and product, or parent and anion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this spectrum, scale and subtract out the parent. I'm going to take this spectrum, and I'm going to scale and subtract the parent out again. And when I do that, I get these three pure parent, anion, and product spectra. You can see these derivative-like shapes just from poor subtraction. Okay, It's not that poor, but it's uh, <laughs> not ideal. 
Then you can ask the question, if the average is the black, basically, uh, uh, spectrum, can I reconstruct the average simply by taking the relative uh, contributions of these three different species into account? Okay? So it turns out that I can take, uh, I forgot the exact percentages, I should remember because this is uh, fresh, but nonetheless, so the statement that I'm going to make is you have at least too much more anion contributing to the average spectrum than product. <laughs> so a major basically intermediate or product, if you want, which, which is kind of, uh, if you know, if you've thought about plasma enhanced chemistry, anions are the first suspect because you charged molecules. That's step zero, at least in this reaction. Uh, so this guy contributes twice as much as the product uh, to the overall spectrum, which we can reconstruct faithfully by just doing a simple Y equal uh, A1 spectrum one plus B, B spectrum two and C spectrum three. So a linear fit just gives you the almost perfect reconstruction of the average. So at the end, you know, this is my last science slide. Uh, so at the end of it all, uh, we're trying to do terse, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know so some people are interested in, in fundamental physical and chemical processes at the interfaces, and I'm, I'm one of them. So I, I you know, I, I enjoy looking at the optic rectification, understanding physics there. I enjoy looking at tunneling uh, through molecular resonances. I enjoy looking at uh, chemistry and the real space in this case, you know, a few nanometers. This is a dream uh, for many physical chemists and chemical physicists like myself. But uh, we'd like to do analytical terms. So we'd like to be able to just look at the object without inducing changes in it. Okay? Uh, things like, uh, you know, very high fields, uh, DC fields, um, things like uh, chemistry and things like charging are essentially uh, you know, dancing around Heisenberg in a sense, I guess, uh, but this is your, to, to, to look at these objects, you're changing them, okay? At least you're changing them in contact mode terms. So this is a silver nanocube. This is AFM, and in terms, you can almost make out the 3D, basically, structure of the cube, per my previous arguments of, uh, of, uh, of how terms maps the, you know, three-dimensional three topographic features of any particular object. But anyways, this is a facet facet, you see this, okay? So this is the contact motors map. Uh, it's average spectrum, you know, just along all the bright pixels is the black guy. And again, you see the shoulder over here, this other shoulder over here. So you have anions, you have these two little peaks that arise from the product. So by looking at, in this case, nitrothiophenol, I'm changing it, okay? Turns out if you do tapping motors, <laughs> which is very difficult in practice, you can actually eliminate uh, or suppress uh, the contribution of the anion and the contribution of the product to the spectrum. So this spectrum is the pure, pure parent spectrum that we were able to get by just integrating over some of these uh, basically uh, bright pixels. So pure analytical terse, weaker signal, uh, invasive terse, stronger signal, but you know, uh, you're changing the method that you're uh, supposed to be just looking at non-invasively. After all, that is the promise of optical spectroscopy. So with that, I have you know, a few conclusions to, 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 to say, uh, some of them contentious perhaps, uh, but here's, here's our, my, my personal thoughts on all this. So there are a bunch of physical and chemical processes that you, know, you see in terms. Charging chemistry, multipolar Raman, local DC fields, that is rectification. And then this is all exasperated and, and complicated in uh, high resolution, spatial resolution terms and uh, you know, ultra sensitive terms because you have uh, non ergodicity and, uh, and in real space you have tensorial Raman scattering. So these two are related but are not exactly equivalent. That's philosophy. So my take on it is embrace the complexity and really try to understand it all because you can't wish it all away, right? So achieving the terse promise is well worth the effort, at least from where I stand. So I do not claim that I understand everything I see, uh, especially when you are, again, in the, in the realm of single molecule and ultra high resolution terms. Uh, if you see steady, stable spectra and you're not at one Kelvin, something is off, okay? You're, you're, you're not achieving basically high resolution, perhaps, and, and, uh, and or uh, uh, basically uh, you're averaging over a whole bunch of molecules, okay? Maybe using a fat, smooth tip or something, okay? Uh, and then basically, uh, uh, you know, the last hope, I guess, from this is uh, we, we hope all these studies that most of what I showed you today is very fresh. So these are late 2019 and mostly 2020 publications. It just came out in four back-to-back -back papers in a month in JPC-LET, actually. So we hope these results really, you know, 
gets folks, there's practitioners, and I told them our friends in theory that play on earth to just go back to the basics and think about fundamental terms, the fields there, the molecular response there, try to push a theory that treats maybe uh, molecules and metals on equal footing, as opposed to just trying to find the flashy application of, hey, I can do catalysis, or hey, I can do, I can do bioimaging, but I don't understand any of my spectra, except the ones I show in the publication. Anyway, so, uh, you know, I, I'd like to de you know, dedicate this to one of my 2019 uh, DOE early career reviewers. He gave me a very low grade, and the reasoning behind that was, uh, why think about charging multiples, local DC fields and tensorial RAM and just pick one and stick with it. The statement is they're all there. Again, you can't push it all away. So with that, I'd like to conclude by uh, saying there is no I in science and, uh, and uh, acknowledging the folks that worked on this. So Ashish actually did most of the terrorist imaging measurements. He now moved on in life. He's at Intel. Shifon uh, took over and he's up to speed uh, and you know, Ashish had train him so he's in very good shape and he's being productive. He works closely with Brian O'Callaghan, who, whose name you will see appear more and more on our papers because he's contributing to the terms measurements. In addition to doing his uh, daytime duties, which are uh, IR SNOM. Helen and Oliver were temporary staff. Uh, Helen is actually a, a high school student. You will see her name on a couple of recent papers. And Oliver was a visiting faculty that is now uh, moved on inside the lab to other duties and activities. Uh, Alan and Kevin mostly do the, the uh, photo emission electron microscopy works, but Alan helps us with the classical numerical simulations, and Kevin contributes to the, 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 the paper writing and as well as data analysis and some tourist measurements. So we all live under the same roof. Uh, eventually, everybody contributes and helps each other out. And finally, last but not least, Horiba's one and only Andre Kreyer over here. If you know Andre, you know this is not his picture, but I thought that make a point out of it. And then and in terms of funding, uh, these, these, these ideas started off as a Linus Pauling uh, Distinguished uh, Fellowship at PNNL. This is a internally, internal money, yeah, LDRD, we call it. And then externally, this, this was funded, uh, you know, a lot of the instrumentation and instrument development was funded through a, a BER technology development project with Scott Lee and Brian, actually. Uh, that was 2016 to 2019. And very recently, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is a program that supports much of the fundamental uh, tip and hand uh, uh, investigations that I am a thrust lead on, and that basically paid the bill. So with, with that, uh, you know, I'd like to thank you for taking time um, in these difficult times to listen in, and uh, hope everybody is just staying safe, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Patrick. I mean, that was a fantastic talk. If you say you don't really understand everything, then I have no idea what I should say about myself. <laughs> um, let's see if we can make a dent on these questions over here. Um, for the molecule used with tile mm -hmm. and cyanide group during TERS, was it easy to attach to the tip? Why did you choose this molecule? So, um, in most of the of the imaging works, uh, it really doesn't matter what molecule you use, right? So you're, you're taking advantage of the fact that the molecule has three and minus six vibrations and each one of these vibrations has its own tensor elements and they change differently when you shake along the different modes, right? So essentially, uh, uh, doesn't really matter. I like thiols indeed because they attach easily. In fact, half my sample prep is you just drop cast molecules uh, then you sonicate or you wash very rigorously to make sure that you don't have too thick of a layer. And the next question becomes, how do you know that you have a thin layer? And the answer is, if you don't, you don't get terse, right? Uh, so uh, uh, I like them because they're very easy. And the way we functionalize the tip is very simple. You just drop cast molecules on anything. Once you land the tip, it's functionalized. Okay, so we actually do a glass slide. Uh, we land the tip into it, withdraw the tip, change into our sample, and all of a sudden the tip is functionalized. All right, thank you. Next mm -hmm. question. In the gold nanorod example, we see two different spatial frequencies, four nodes versus five nodes at two different resonances. Mm -hmm. What is the reason behind it? So these are actually uh, different optical modes of these, so these, of these uh, rods. So these rods have two major uh, resonances that people are familiar with, okay? So you have the longitudinal dipole. Uh, do you see my slides? Yes. Okay, so let me go back to presentation mode here. 
So you have two longitudinal dipoles. So the first one for this kind of length rod is in the near infrared region, about uh, about uh, you know 1200, 1300 nanometers or so. So that mode has something lighting up at this end and something lighting up at this end. Then somewhere at around 500-ish, I think, for these particles, you have another mode, which is the transverse dipole. So they will have something lighting up right here and something lighting up right here, OK? So between the two bright dipolar, uh, basically, uh, resonances, you have these kinds of resonances that we can resolve in real space, OK? These are multipolar plasmonic eigenmodes of the, of, the, of the rods. So these are just basically, if you look at the UVVs, uh, UVV spectrum of these particles, Unfortunately, we cannot do single particle UVVs, but if you could, you will see very weak resonances uh, right between uh, basically 500 and 1200 nanometers. And these resonances, both dipolar and multipolar, they change in, uh, in, in, in the, the change. Once you change the length of the rod, you're increasing the size of the box. Uh, so longer basically wires give you more red shifted uh, uh, both dipolar and multipolar resonances. So in this paper over here, if you go in, you will see that we looked at different rod lengths. And for the different long red, rod lengths, we see different orders. So over here, we see five to four. For something that's slightly shorter, we see four to three. And for something that's you know the shortest we measured, we actually see three to two. So we can see all the systematically, all the differences in orders between uh, basically different multipolar resonances. And there are a bunch of very pretty EELS papers uh, you know, I would say 2012 ish to 2014 that do this in theory and experiment very elegantly. That's quite interesting, actually. Okay, let's try another one. For the terse mapping of gold tip on a substrate, how to exclude the possibility that the fluctuations arise from the unstable AFM control since gold tip is large? I don't care. <laughs> so that is something probably Andre can answer better, but. Um, you know, um, as long as I can understand it, and I, I wouldn't worry too much about feedback, okay? This, 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 remember that uh, all the terse spectra, for the most part, are collected, except for the last slide, are collected in contact. So it's not that difficult to maintain contact uh, uh, mode feedback over a second, uh, you, know, or, you know, this is actually quarter second type integration times, right? So uh, I would say that uh, I would be more, more worried about, uh, uh, you know, uh, things like ripening your tip, uh, although we do use very minimal powers, you can see the conditions in these papers. Uh, I would worry about things like burning molecules if I have uh, resonant Raman reporters like dyes, which I never use, uh, because over there something along the lines of five uh, microwatts already <laughs> causes photodegradation, right? So tip, I would say, you know, maintaining feedback is, uh, I, I, I would guess uh, Andre is boiling and insulted right now, is, is kind of a no-brainer. There are more functional things to worry about uh, throughout the measurement. Mm. Okay. Let me see if I can interpret this one right. The purpose of terse imaging of nanoparticles, I guess, what's the purpose of terse imaging of nanoparticles? Is it to understand the mechanism and will this contribute to the use of plasmonic nanoparticles? So I would say, uh, you know, if you want to try and, uh, and, uh, and uh, use particles as, you know, in SIRS, for example, uh, how would you, what are the properties that you, you want to be able to, 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 to understand, right? So the properties would be the resonances, very easy to measure, even single particle spectra. Uh, the other one would be basically the, the uh, local optical fields and how they vary in space, right? So if you're trying to do chemistry, you want to be able to map spatial variations in electric fields, over molecular length scales. So name me one technique that can give you uh, basically uh, localized optical field maps that vary over one or two nanometer, uh, basically, length scales. So someone would come and say eels, and my response to that would be uh, inelastic electron scattering, you know, in the visible region of the spectrum. They do that in EV. I cannot think in EV. Uh, gives you something along the order of four or five nanometer spatial resolution. Uh, something like PEAM can go down to, you know, 10 nanometers, five nanometers even. I think the highest spatial resolution local optical field mapping that you can get is, is with TERS itself. So in part, this is, I think, a new way of just uh, doing ultra high spatial resolution mapping of local optical fields. And of course, you can do single particle resonances that turn out not to really matter from my tip example. Uh, it's very important to characterize not just structure, 
but also local optical fields, you know, with molecular resolution. Okay, and we're pushing towards that. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Dear Patrick, thank, thank you for the interesting talk. In which mode is the plasmon enhanced chemistry on NTP recorded? In case of tapping contact mode, don't the molecules stick to the tip surface? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is spec up. Yeah. So this is essentially, uh, uh, this is a, uh, contact mode uh, when you're basically measuring the spectra, otherwise tapping mode to move from pixels to pixels. Does the molecule stick to the surface? Uh, sorry, to the surface of the tip? Yes. Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> Does it uh, change the spatial distribution? Right? I point you, to, I point you towards the, uh, I don't know if you see my cursor. So I point you towards the parent map, right? So the parent map actually displays two different uh, edges that are being enhanced over here. These are actually two stacked plates, if you look very closely over here. So that and that is the local optical field map. Yeah, I have parents everywhere. I do not have products everywhere, right? So simple answer is, yeah, sure, you pick up molecules. But remember that you are you know, multiplexing. You're looking at parents and products at the same time. That is to say, it doesn't matter <laughs> if the molecule is on the tip or if the molecule is on the parent. Uh, for my intents and purposes, but for chemical reaction mapping, indeed, uh, that complicates the story. But if I compare these two maps, I can definitely say that I have product only over here and I have parent pretty much everywhere along the two edges. Okay, let me see. Maybe we can do one or two more. When looking at a single molecule motion and frequency, such as on slide 14, do you see a change of their point motion with surface coverage that would give us a handle on molecule molecule coupling and interactions on the surfaces of the nanoparticles? So slide 14. Here. So this is a complicated question. Can you please repeat it? Okay. When looking at a single molecule motion and frequencies, such as on slide 14, mm -hmm. do you see a change of their point motion with surface coverage that would give us a handle on molecule-molecule coupling and interactions on the surfaces of the nanoparticles? No idea. <laughs> so I haven't thought about uh, essentially uh, zero point motion in this context, right? Uh, but, but essentially uh, uh, intermolecular interactions uh, uh, should basically affect the spectra that you see, right? Uh, naturally. Uh, we don't see any evidence of that, uh, you know, in, in terms of the coverage that we use, but I do not know the exact answer. This is something I'd have to consider and think about. Intermolecular interactions uh, and, 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 and how they affect basically the observables. No answer. Okay, good answer. <laughs> and then the last, the last question, is it possible to use TERS for an analytical tool for qualitative and quantitative analysis? So I, I think so, right? So, so um, many of the effects that I talked about today uh, are going to be dependent on two things. Okay? The first is going to be uh, uh, the resonances that are accessible in the tip there's geometry and this will change when you change your tip. This will change when you change your substrate and apparently when you change your molecule, right? So uh, the question, you know, the, the, the answer, I guess, to this question is it's very much system dependent. Uh, I try to expose uh, the 99 spectra that I do not understand as opposed to publishing the one that I understand. And I, I think for this field to move forward, everybody should be thinking about all these kind of effects and maybe more, there are smarter people out there, uh, for their own kind of systems. That is to say, doing benchmarking, understanding, you know, how optical rectification changes for, you know, going from proteins, if any, and, and going to single bases and going to, you know, catalytic particles and so on. So you just have to ask these, these kinds of questions, I think, and probably more questions again uh, for your particular sample. I don't think it's, it's dead and buried. I get a joy out of maybe fishing out these, these effects. Uh, overall, you can still, of course, do mapping. You can understand, uh, uh, you know, most or many of your spectra. So the answer is yes and no, but but one has to be cautious uh, because for different systems, uh, there are different sets of uh, 
operating physics. So it's, I think your duty as a terse practitioner to take the set of molecules and, and, and substrates that you worry about and try to understand everything there is to understand from a basic viewpoint. Uh, only then will the field move forward as an analytical field. I would say that was a great way of closing. Thank you so much, Patrick. Yep, thank you, Marcin. I'll be sending you guys the rest of the questions so you can handle them via email because sure. we can possibly answer them all. Um, okay, so our last talk is going to be from Tom, but I think before that, Maybe we can take a short, like a three minute break. And then we'll come back to, to see Tom's talk. I'm gonna start the timer and thank you so much, Patrick, again. Sure thing.